This interview is for information only and should not be considered as investment advice or a recommendation to buy shares in the company featured. Welcome to this stock box interview. of Katoro following the uh, publication of the company's interim. So thank you very much for your time, Patrick. How are you? Oh, very well. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Mike. It's good to be speaking to you. So just quickly on the, the interims here, I did notice that uh, some of the highlights really were that the loss is considerably less than in previous reporting periods and your net liability moved to a net asset position of 15,000 and you have cash reserves of just about a quarter of a million pounds. So just a few words to start us off on the, the state of the nation, if you like, the state of the affairs, of course, since you've come in and uh, really started to change things around with the company. Well, that's right. I mean, the company's obviously had a, you know, some significant investment, uh, some important investors that have uh, come into the picture earlier in the year. Um, a clear shift in terms, of, uh, in terms of the assets of the company, you know, on the books at least, and uh, certainly, um, a much better, much more stabilized financial position and a really good solid uh, base, you know, to continue forward, yeah. Okay, good. Well, it's good to sort of reset the page, and as you say, a, a solid base to continue forward. I know last time you spoke to, to us on Stockbox here, we talked a lot about the uranium project, the White Pine uranium project that you recently picked up. And I recall that you said to, to Pam, our interviewer there, that you couldn't believe almost that it was available. So you, you snapped it up. So I just want to sort of ask you, sort of, you know, why uranium? Why now? I mean, people will know that uranium is quite a hot commodity. Is this a case of jumping on the bandwagon, or is there something a bit more to it? Okay, I mean, look, essentially, we have experience, uh, you know, on the board, myself included, uh, with regards to uranium, uranium exploration, developing assets, um, and uranium's had um, had it's certainly. It's come back into play over the past couple of years. It's been building nicely. It's obviously been very high towards the end of last year, but at eighty dollars and thereabouts uh, uh, per per pound. I mean, U three hundred eight. Uh, that's a very you know, that's that's actually a very uh, solid price. It it looks that the fundamentals for uranium are exceptionally good, and I've made some reference to that on the interim commentary. Uh, obviously, we're we're looking at something long term. We're in early stage exploration, so we're looking to the market. These uh, overall demand is growing. It's set to demand. Nuclear power stations are being built. We're operating in a jurisdiction uh, in Ontario where over half of their electricity comes from nuclear power. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a question of getting involved in critical and strategic uh, metals, and that's what we're about now. Okay, so do you see the sort of demand curve for uranium really sort of staying where it is potentially increasing? Fifty percent of the energy from Ontario comes from uranium, so that's that's probably quite a unique case, isn't it? Globally, I'd have thought. Well, I, I mean, I think that's the the fact is that it uh, that it that Ontario is 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 not unique. Fifty percent is quite high for the amount of electricity that's generated from nuclear in that province. Uh, it's obviously a very pro nuclear province. Uh, contains most of Canada's uh, reactors. There's other countries such as France, which produced more, I mean, in the 70s of percent in electricity and exported across Europe to countries that are not even generating nuclear uh, electricity. No, uh, globally, uh, the reactors are being built. The demand is going to grow much higher. And what's happening in this, in the, the net zero target, 2050 net zero carbon target, uh, which may or may not be achieved, is fundamentally, we're going to have to move to lower carbon forms of uh, electricity. And, and, and clearly, nuclear is the lowest carbon generating form, even compared with solar or with uh, wind turbines. Okay. And that cool. because you have to build in, you have to build in the construction, the carbon associated with the construction and the maintenance. Of that. So, so there's that. Um, so we do see uranium, the uranium price as a fundamentally solid. Uh, and something that will has been fun, fundamentally solid, something that will grow due to demand. Um, yeah. How that uh, how that price grows and how it affects the supply and demand. There's many projects that are, will be uh, uh, economic at high uranium prices, and some that will remain economic at lower uh, uranium prices. The question is to find the right balance. So, um, well, I could probably speak more about the technical merits of, say, white pie. Uh, 
in, in respect of, say, how an investor would compare it to another uranium opportunity. So what we're looking at is very early stage exploration. We're looking at something that is igneous. Uh, it's associated with igneous intrusions. Okay, so that's different than many of the types of uranium deposits that people would be familiar with. So, for example, yeah. Athabasca Basin, very high grade, but deep, expensive, often very remote. So if you're, if you're in the Athabasca Basin and you're not near existing mines or existing infrastructure, then you're looking at something potentially, for a junior exploration such as us, outside of our league. Okay? Uh, if you're looking at sediment-hosted uranium, so you're looking in Southern Africa, where I have a lot of experience, Namibia, uh, elsewhere, uh, then you're looking at lower grades, okay? But then the advantage is potentially uh, the mining costs are, are lower, right? So, so we're looking at igneous, an igneous style potentially, and that's probably people would be familiar with a rosting out of, your, out of uh, Namibia, which has been growing for decades, uh, Palabora in South Africa. And then there's an example to the southeast of us in uh, Ontario called Bancroft, where you have basically a granite intrusion, so a hot, big uh, magma that's coming up through the earth, interacting with the country rock. Uh, fluids are coming off, containing uranium, pegmatites, all this sort of activity, which then deposits the uranium in the country rock. That's what we're looking for. Um, okay. I could explain it in a little bit more detail if you'd like, but uh, that well, is we the, can probably the, go into more sort of technical detail in a special feature at some point later on. Really, yeah, that's looking what I think. at uh, yeah. your latest presentation and some of the plans that you have there. But I mean, it's very interesting what you talk there about ind indigenous uh, uranium here. And of course, people will be very familiar with Athabasca, those unconformity, very high grade, but it's also quite a hostile and remote environment. And of course, Namibia as well. So what makes you think, I mean, this is early stage, isn't it, that, that this, this project here? And, and I know there was yeah. some, some sampling and, and you've talked about sort of very highly anomalous uranium here. So, I mean, what gives you the, the confidence that this is a, a good jurisdiction and a good prolific place to perhaps find a discovery? Where's the potential? Well, the potential is, is in the geological setting, number one. So we, we have, we're, we're, we're confident that of these, the position of these um, these granitic intrusions. Okay, so we have two big batholiths, two big large granite intrusions. Between them, there is, you know, quite ancient, uh, quite deformed, and you know, a lot of structure happening. So it's like a, an interesting place geologically between two granites because there's different pressures, different different things happening. And then on top of that, we had this. Uh, we have the the results from a. Um, a series of surveys that were conducted by the government, by the Geological Survey of, of Ontario. Um, and I must say, uh, a, very a, a very extensive program. So I think some 28 million Canadian dollars spent on, mm -hmm. on a, r r right across Ontario. Um, now, we, we've been lucky enough to pick up you know, the data from, well, it's, it's available, but we've picked up the data from three, three of those surveys. So three of say, seven surveys since, two, uh, since 99. Um, okay. There's a sunk cost in that, which we don't even have to concern ourselves with. I mean, millions of dollars of Canadian dollars, potentially. We, we, we estimated, I mean, this is really just a, a very broad estimate, but maybe some half a million dollars to 750,000 Canadian dollars to acquire the data you'd need that we've then used to hone in on white pine. And white pine has, an ex has exceptionally anomalous greens. So we have in there, in lake sediments, and I need to, I need to be absolutely clear, these are lake sediments. So this is, this is material that's runoff, and we think from nearby, uh, with grades up to 140, 120, 100 in the hundreds of ppms. Now, if you're mining uranium in Namibia, you might have a cutoff of 100, 100 or 150. In your mind, but we're not planning to mine lake sediments. So we, we need to answer the question: Why are there such high grades sitting in lake sediments in this area in White Pine? Okay, so that's really the that's really the the attraction there. Okay. Okay. A answer that question: Why? Okay. And 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 how do you plan to answer that question? Why are there high grade uh, sediments waiting in the in the? <laughs> well, in the so we so we start. That's excellent because we've 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 already got a body of knowledge in terms of uh, the the sampling. You've got a body of knowledge in terms of what the Ontario Geological Survey provided in terms of mapping, 
surf surficial uh, mapping from aerial photography as well. So we understand the kind of deposits like uh, glacial deposits, st uh, stream deposits and such. We have some very high quality uh, aerial photography or satellite imagery. And, um, and the, real, the real bonus here for us, and it answers a lot of the questions that have been raised in, you know, in this interview thus far, is that we're just about five, as the crow flies, about five or seven kilometers from the main uh, Trans-Canada Highway. Now, that's very significant. So a junior such as us, and we, we recognize that we come from a very, you know, very small market cap, low base, we're, we're watching our, the pennies. We don't have to mobilize helicopters, which is like practically, you know, all of the uranium projects in Canada at the moment are flying teams in helicopters. We are literally driving, a, you know, an hour from Dryden, which is, you know, 70 k's up the road. And guys can get in on, on foot, on, you know, the four wheel drive, uh, little bikes, you know, and, uh, and access looks good. So, so that's a, that's a very important point of it. Okay, so in terms of the work you'd be carrying out, um, what, yeah. what does it look like? Putting people on the ground, analysing all the past data? Yeah, so, I mean, in the first instance, we'll, we, we'll be accessing, you know, um, it, there's a lot of log, logging tracks, I, I should say. So the area is covered in okay. logging track. So, we'll be, so there's been a lot of commercial logging over the area, and I've seen some photographs now. Uh, there'll be, it'll be sampling, It'll be using a scintillometer, so you're actually measuring your uh, radioactivity on the ground. Uh, mm -hmm. We have historic airborne survey, which includes uh, radio, radiometric uh, readings, and they're very they're very positive. Uh, but it's historic data; it's just in in plan form and paper form. Let's say we don't have the raw data. We may be able to get that. It's it that's not guaranteed. But it, it, the main thing is that we'll be on the ground, being able to conf confirm what's physically what are we getting the readings from what's what's causing the response okay. why do we have these high risk uh, lake sediments uh, responses and and understanding the geology so the, in the first instance it's very you know prospecting trying to okay. understand what's where the high grades can potentially come from and um, and, start, and start to understand the picture a bit better okay so yeah early stage prospecting and this is throughout quarter four this year yeah, so I'm, I'm in the next in the next few weeks. We're we're busy. Um, we won't be. We there'll, there'll come a period where we will have heavy snowfall, and you sure. know it, it, then it will not be practical to because we won't be able to look at outcrop. Uh, and there is quite a significant amount of outcrop, so rock at surface in this area. Uh, so at some point that becomes impractical. Uh, but there's a there's a lot of uh, desktop. There's a lot of um, data okay. to, to kind of go through. Remember, I've only picked this up a few weeks ago, so sure. uh, everything so thus far very positive. Uh, okay. But there's plenty of work that we can do remotely until we get in there in the spring. So we will have devised a very clear plan, uh, and we'll be sensible about how we go in the longer term. Again, I must come back to access. This is something that you can be potentially drilling on or sampling on. You know, uh, right through the year. Uh, so it's not it's not like uh, one of these situations where we can't go there because of the rains or the snow. Potentially, in the future, once we've had established drill target, you can be drilling in the winter time. That's not necessarily a problem. So, okay. And then just remember again, access via the highway, which is a you know three. It's a it's open year round. So that's that's uh, I think really yeah. It's going to be very helpful. Okay, good. Well, let's see how those sort of plans develop. In terms of the cash position, about a quarter of a million, are you fairly comfortable with that at the moment? So we, yeah, so we have a, a low burn rate. So, the, so Katora Gold no longer has a, uh, an association with the, you know, the, with the company it was spun out of, the Kibo. Katora Gold exists as uh, basically uh, online. Myself, uh, you know, my, my other directors, we're, we're scattered kind of globally. Uh, we have key people. We have a key person now at the moment, a guy representing us in Canada. We have technical help, uh, you know, from a wide variety of sources and a kind of a key, okay. uh, you know, core team. So we're low cost. We don't even have, uh, we, don't, we don't have like offices that we're paying office overheads and such like this. We've really uh, trimmed things down. And I think that's also evident from those interns. Uh, so I'm, I'm confident going forward that we're going to, we're going to give people the maximum bang for their buck in terms of uh, early stage exploration, okay. 
in uh, in Uran. I'd like to add, uh, Mark, that yeah, I'd like to add that we're also in the we're 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 we're, we're, we're reviewing uh, other projects as we go forward. So we know yeah, this is well, just a start okay. for us. And I, okay, so yeah, I was going to ask about that because, of course, you, you mentioned that about the sort of first mover acquirer, and, and you've talked about how the markets yeah. have been a little bit tough in in the R and S there, and of course. Katoro Gold was the name of the company, and of course, gold doing very well. So, yeah, tell us a little about any other opportunities you might be looking at. We're not, I mean, we're not averse to gold, and but it, you know, at the, at, uh, essentially, people are watching a very uh, solid gold price as well. Of course, look, we're, sure. we're looking to rebrand. That's been on the cards for for some time since you know since before I joined the company. Uh, we we're 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 demonstrating now that we're we're moving, we're active. We're we're uh, we're looking at different jurisdictions, so we're managing our jurisdictional risk, and we're very focused on what we believe are the strategic and critical minerals to you know to be involved. With. Okay. So I think that's a case of uh, watch this space, but we're we're working very hard to you know to to basically grow the portfolio, and that's really you know the stated goal uh, from some months back. Um, a solid uh, financial base, I believe, and. Um, and a good team, good experience, um, and a wider sort of network as well that you know that we're looking to develop and 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 and, and bring bring Katoro into the investors' uh, sort of uh, spotlight. You know. Yeah. Okay. And what do you think would attract investors? What do you think might move the dial for investors here? I think that's the thing. I think that what what should move the dial for investors is that you know you've got a. A company that's had clearly had some difficult times. That's that's sort of cleared the decks, put itself in a very mm-hmm. stable financial position, has good support, has uh, has taken a new direction with a you know a, a change in leadership, new exec, uh, new non-executive chairman, myself, uh, who's brought in other technical help where we need it, and who's you know who's very clear about uh, the focus on in a in a, in a critical uh, space and strategic space and where we you know. Uh, where we can we can review and we can we can move uh, uh, at at a, at a pace that perhaps others won't. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time, Patrick Cullen, the CEO of Katoro, and looking forward to seeing how your uh, other projects or other opportunities come to fruition, or indeed uh, more developments on the plans for the uranium at White Pine. But thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you, Mark. If you enjoyed this interview, then give us a thumbs up, a like or a retweet. Subscribe to us on YouTube or follow us on Twitter and hit that notification bell to be the first to know when we release new content. There's loads of great content on our website too, across all our programs at stockboxmedia.com. Thank you for watching.